Hello and welcome to this tutorial on WANs. A WAN stands for Wide Area Network, and they are different than LANs, local area networks. However, they're related to LANs. So we're going to take a look at the two and compare and contrast a bit to get a better understanding of a wide area network. And then we'll go ahead and take a look at the types of connections made in a wide area network and how they differ from local area networks. So this is a local area network, and in this case we just have a few PCs on a switch with a router, and we have internet access. The primary characteristic of a local area network is that geographically speaking, it's pretty restricted. So it could be a small office, it could be one floor of many floors in a building, so perhaps the entire building is a local area network, but generally speaking, it's relatively small. There are also campus lands, and that would look something like this, where you have, say, a group of buildings, and each building is connected uh, between switches, so Ethernet is the primary technology here. Um, but these buildings are relatively close together. Perhaps it's a college campus, or perhaps it's uh, an industrial park, and there are buildings together for a particular company, and they all work together, and they're on the same network. But what happens if the distance between building A and building B is not just 100 yards or right next door? What if it's a couple thousand miles away? Well, what do we talk about then? Is this still a local area network? Well, the answer is no, and that's where wide area networks or WANs come into play. So instead of having two buildings that are right next door to each other or, let's say, a couple hundred yards apart, now we have two local area networks that are in two different cities, New York and San Francisco. So that's about 3,000 miles apart. So connecting these two by simply running an Ethernet crossover cable between two switches on each network isn't possible anymore. Um, Ethernet has distance limitations, and also, even if they weren't limitations, running that cable across the country just isn't feasible for many reasons. So a wide area network is formed when you connect multiple local area networks that are geographically far apart. So a big characteristic, the primary characteristic of a wide area network is that geographically larger distances between equipment of the same network uh, exists. So clearly here we have a wide area network because we're connecting two lands in two different cities many miles apart and yet these lands are of the same company or the same organization. So they want all the benefits as if they were all located geographically close together. And that's where the wide area network comes in. It enables us to gain those benefits um, as if we are all in the same geographic area. We've connected all of the distant parts of the same network. So this link we're looking at between the two routers, it's going to be different. And there are many ways of, of connecting uh, LANs to form a WAN. And not only are the circuits different, but the, e, the equipment involved is also different. So the first characteristic to know about the circuits is that, or, or links, is that they're usually not owned by the enterprise or the company. Um, it's just not cost effective for a company to build their own circuit especially here, thousands of miles. And also, it's almost impossible because you need to get what they refer to as land rights. I need permission to run this cable over this particular plot of land because I don't own the land. Well, imagine trying to do that across the country or then even try imagine doing that between two countries or across an ocean. It's just not feasible. So that's where service providers come into play or the telecom companies. They provide what is often referred to as um, a leased line where the circuit is provisioned by the, the telecom or the service provider and the enterprise leases that line. There are many different types of leased lines. There is a synchronous serial leased line. There you'll hear things like circuit switched leased lines or packet switched like frame relay. Um, we're going to focus on one particular type and it's called the point to point because it's really the most common you'll see in today's networks. Although, definitely take a, a moment to check out the frame relay tutorials because there's a lot of frame relay still out there, um, and so you will probably come across that. 
So when we talk about WAN connectivity, we can talk about a di couple different types of circuits. We'll pay attention to the point-to-point -point circuit. And you're going to hear a couple different names for, for circuits in general. You'll hear least line or just circuit. You might hear P2P -P standing for point-to-point -point link if you're talking about a point-to-point -point circuit. You may hear least circuit or least line, um, serial link or serial line. These are all same names, uh, different names that refer to the same thing. Now, a point-to-point -point circuit connects two points, point A to point B, and that's it. Doesn't So no one else has access to it except for point A and point B. So because of that, it's sometimes referred to as a private line or a private circuit as well because the rest of the world can't get to it. It's exclusive to the people who bought it from the service provider. So that's important because you get a certain amount of security over that link because it's dedicated to your use. Also, just a side note, point-to-point -point circuits and most circuits provided by service providers are full duplex, meaning they can send and receive at the same time. So let's take a look at some of the components we have here. First, we have something referred to as the CPE, and that stands for Client Premise Equipment. So this is all of the equipment that resides at the client's network. So if you're the enterprise and you purchased a point-to-point -point circuit from the telecom provider, your equipment is referred to as a CPE. The service provider doesn't have any access to it. They don't manage it for you. It's yours. In the CPE, you can think of it as two parts. A router, which we know about, does routing and many other functions for us, and the CSU-DSU. We focus on the CSU-DSU in detail in another tutorial, but for purposes here, it's responsible for clocking or making sure it is in sync with the other devices from the service provider network and the other end of the circuit. So it's used for timing. You could think of it that way. Here we have it separated into two different physical pieces of equipment, and that's the way it was commonly done, um, but now things are a little bit different. The CSU DSU is oftentimes built into a serial card which fits on the router, so you don't normally see a separate piece of equipment. However, even if that's the case these days, it's good to conceptually think of it as a different piece of equipment because it does something dedicated, has a dedicated function to it. And so it's kind of relevant to our discussion here. So after the CPE, we have the leased line itself. So we can imagine that's our leased line, but like we just said, it could also go straight to the router itself if the CSU DSU is located inside the router. This lease line has a couple different names. Um, sometimes it's referred to as the local loop or the last mile. And on the service provider side, it's usually connected to something called uh, a WAN switch. You could think of it that way, or a router of some type. It would really vary between the type of connectivity, the type of point-to-point -point circuit, and the service provider, but they're landing it on hardware on their side as well. The service provider network is potentially very big and could span, uh, span you know, multiple continents. The area that you connect to, meaning the area that provisions your circuit is often referred to as the CO or central office and that's just a location that the service provider has they have a lot of equipment there and they use that to provision circuits to people nearby so depending on where you're located you would go to a specific CO and there could be COs all over this provider's network so they're geographically relevant now when this, when this circuit is provisioned to your company, it's oftentimes located in the building in like a wiring room or something like that. And actually, the service provider provisions a piece of equipment, um, depending on the type of circuit, where the circuit actually terminates. And then your equipment connects to that same point. So although we drew these leased lines, the local loop going all the way into our equipment, in detail, it actually, they both connect up at a common spot. That common spot is often referred to as the DMARC. And that stands for demarcation. And it's very important because that signifies who's responsible for what. So if our DMARC is here, and the service provider says, I provision your circuit, go to the DMARC and connect to it. 
Everything to the left in our diagram of the DMARC is our responsibility. Everything on the right-hand side is the service provider's responsibility. Up until the other CSU and the other uh, CPE pair over here. So when you hear DMARC, think of uh, it's it's a it's a point. It's like a line in the sand. Uh, who's responsible for what? Okay. Now, the circuit then goes through the service provider network, and it's not going to be uh, just one circuit going, you know, physically going by. It's going to be connecting uh, to different points within the service provider network and eventually come out to a DMARC on this side and connect to our equipment over here. And then if it is, in fact, a, a separate CSU-DSU, that would then connect to the router. And we have our CPE pair over here. So these are some of the um, components of WAN connectivity, and they can apply to many different scenarios, but you'll hear them come up quite a bit, and it's important to understand, uh, generally speaking, what they do and how they fit in with each other. To summarize what we went over, when it comes to LANs and WANs, geography matters. If we're talking great distances between many different LANs of the same organization, then we know we have a wide area network. If we're talking about a very small geographic area, then we're talking about a local area network. Then we took a look at some of the connectivity options between uh, LANs to form a WAN, and these are leased lines. And one of the most common these days is the point-to-point -point lease line. Knowing the components of a lease line is very helpful because they come up all the time, whether you're troubleshooting or ordering a circuit um, or just trying to get your head around how it's provisioned. So we talked about the CPE, and which means the, the router and the CSU-DSU itself. We talked about demarcation points and who's responsible for what. And then we talked about the local loop, which is the link from the provider network up to that demarcation point, just a, a common term to, to uh, specify a very specific portion of the lease line. And then we talked about the central office, which is where your lease line comes from, and they're geographically relevant. And that's it. That is the introduction to wide area networks. Thanks for watching.